<clears throat> Thank you, Major. You're welcome. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be gathered here today. And uh, not gonna lie, I was a little intimidated when it came to writing this sermon and speaking about this because this is this is an important one. And all of you probably know, I went to TY a couple weeks ago, and we learned obedience to the Holy Spirit. We learned to wait for the Holy Spirit. So I think without that experience, I would never have been able to write this. So I'm glad about that. So last Sunday, Major Granat gave us a really amazing sermon on the baptism of Jesus. We learned about being intentional and being involved. And now let's continue the narrative to see what the Lord does after his baptism. So to set the stage first, we really only have two players this week. On the one hand, we have Jesus. He really needs no introduction. I mean, I would hope everybody here knows a little bit about him. On the other hand, we have Satan, the devil, the father of lies. Now let's go through this. Jesus was just baptized by John. The heavens have opened up. The Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove resting on the Lord Jesus. And the Father himself is called from heaven, claiming this nobody from Nazareth as his own beloved son. In fact, he says he is well pleased with this Jesus of Nazareth. Just imagine what John and the others there must have thought. They must have been overjoyed. The kingdom of God was ready to move on the scene. Here was their general ready to lead the charge for the holy city. They were going to win souls for God. But instead of gathering followers right away and marching, Jesus seems to disappear. To many of us, must have seemed odd. I've got a feeling John knew what was really going on after all. He had the Holy Spirit as a constant companion while still living in his mother's womb. He knew what was going on. But for the rest, where was Jesus? After the Holy Spirit had descended, he leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus had come to be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. But first, he had to show obedience where Adam had failed miserably. Satan probably thought he'd have an easy time with the temptation of the second Adam. He'd done it before with the first, so he probably wasn't concerned. After all, one way or another, eventually, he could get everyone to sin. At least once. And one sin was all he needed to disqualify Jesus. So let's take a look at how he, he tries to tempt Jesus. The first thing he offers is food. Jesus had been fasting for a very long time, 40 days to be exact. And while, yes, he is God and doesn't need to eat, he's also a man and does need food. I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about the longest you've ever gone without eating. <clears throat> if you're anything like me, it's not that long. 45 minutes for you. <laughs> and it can get painful after a while, doesn't it? Think about it. it. You smell some delicious food cooking. And it's painful not being able to eat it. All you can think about is filling your mouth with something delicious. Hunger is probably something we've all felt before at least once, right? So, if you're going to tempt someone, that's a good place to start. <laughs> Satan approaches Jesus while he's hungry and makes a simple proposal. He says to Jesus, you claim you're the son of God. Well, I can see you're starving. Turn these stones into bread. Not only can you prove who you are to me, but you can also fill your belly. Here the devil is using two of his oldest tricks, desire and pride. We'll come back to pride in a few minutes. For now, let's focus on desire. Like I said, Jesus is starving. I bet a nice loaf of fresh bread sounded pretty appetizing to him at that moment. How many of us, and don't answer this out loud, but how many of us could resist when faced with that temptation? If you're starving and you have the power to change that instantly, to change those stones into bread, or if you're me, change that stone into a burger, wouldn't you do it? Well, Jesus doesn't. Instead, he reminds the devil that we don't just live on bread, but the word of God. Remember that for me. It will come up again. Next, Satan takes Jesus to Jerusalem. I've never been there, but I hear it's beautiful. I hear it's amazing. Has anybody here been there? Major, I'm sure you've been there. Mm -hmm. So the enemy puts Jesus on the highest point of the temple and makes another challenge. He says, if you're really the son of God, throw yourself down off this temple. 
He promised his angels would keep you safe from any harm. What's, what's, what's to be afraid of? Prove who you are to me and the crowds down below. Here, Satan is tempting Jesus with something else we may have all been tempted with in the past. The desire for recognition. How many of us have wanted to be remembered and praised for what we do? How many of us want that recognition so much that we'll go out of our way to make it happen? But Jesus saw past the simple recognition, and he saw something deeper. Satan wasn't just offering him a chance to be an enemy. Satan wanted him, Jesus, to test God. This is one of his oldest tricks. After all, he told Adam and Eve in the garden to basically do the same thing. He said God could re couldn't really mean what he said. He said, just try it. How many of us have tested God like that? Have we pushed the bar even just a little bit just to see what God would do? So Jesus refuses this temptation as well. Sure, he would get recognition if he threw himself off the temple, but the entire plan of salvation would go out the window because it wasn't meant for Jesus to be this popular, well-known celebrity. Jesus wasn't here for the recognition and praise of the crowds, even though it was absolutely due to him. He tells us he didn't come to be served, but to serve. So Satan has one more temptation to give, and he's sure this one's it. He's sure he's picked a winning card now. After all, who can resist power? He takes Jesus to a high mountain and shows him the entire world, every kingdom and the riches and the power and the glory that come with them all. Satan makes a proposal. Jesus can have it all on the condition he worships Satan first. I like the way Luke frames it in his gospel. He goes into more detail about what he says. So here's what it says in Luke's gospel. Satan says, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. You see, the devil knew exactly what Jesus wanted. He wanted to restore the world to God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they handed over the ownership of this world to the devil. He knew God would come back and restore it to its rightful owner eventually. After all, he gained that ownership through trickery and deceit. So Satan decides to try and tempt Jesus with that. He'll play into it. He says, look, I'll give all of it to you. No struggle, no fight, no suffering. Just bow down recognize my power, and worship me just this once, then it can all be yours, Jesus. I will leave. Imagine it for a moment. Jesus knows the plan. He knows how much he's going to suffer to restore this world to God. He knows how he will be hated and spit on and ridiculed, and all of it could be avoided. But again, Jesus recognizes the bigger picture. To do this would be to give Satan authority forever. Nothing would change for humanity, for God, and we would be lost forever. So once again, he declines very forcefully. He makes it clear, only God deserves our worship. No one from the nicest saint to the most wicked devil will ever deserve praise and worship that belong to God. Now, let's take a look at something else. I want you to notice this. Each time Jesus resists, he goes to scripture for his responses. Each reply begins with, it is written. Don't believe me? Check yourself. That's because the, the scriptures are the perfect defense against evil temptations. From personal experience, there have been many times I've been tempted to sin or have sinned. And in those moments, the Holy Spirit puts scripture in my heart. He reminds me exactly what God has to say on a matter. It's not about what John feels or wants in those moments. Sin gets us because the devil and the world tell us to trust our feelings instead of God. Just follow your heart, Satan says. It can't lead you astray. Well, personal experience, and I'm sure we can all relate. We all know that's not true. Our hearts lead us wrong all the time. Instead, we should trust God and what he has to say in his word. And how can we if we don't study it? I love that everyone is here this morning, of course. But let me ask you something. And again, don't answer out loud. Just, just something for you to ask yourself. Is 
what God has to say. Is God important to you the rest of the week? Do you spend time studying his word, or do you only open your Bible when you're here in church? If you don't, then how are you supposed to know God? Scripture's there for a reason, and it's not so you can place it on your coffee table to show your guests how Christian you are. An unopened Bible is as useless to you as a driver's license is to me. Take a look at this. Each response Jesus gives is from Scripture. He is completely rooted in God's Word. But I want you to, I want you to check this out, too. During one temptation that Satan gives, he also quotes from Scripture. Here, Satan had twisted scripture to suit his needs. A lot of people do that today. They love to put verses all over the place, and yet they know nothing about what that verse means. They pick and choose what they like and just ignore the rest. For some, they only care about the New Testament. I fell into that trap. They forget the Old Testament. After all, talking about God being harsh, condemning sin, flooding the world isn't going to get butts in the seats and ties in the offering plate. And yet, it, and yet it's just as important. It's just as important part of scripture as John 3.16. We all know that one. If we pick and choose, then we do exactly what Satan did when he took Psalm 91 to try and tempt Jesus. When we study scripture, we can recognize when it is being abused and misused. Jesus had such knowledge to resist Satan. Scripture is a powerful weapon that can tear down the enemy's entire worthless kingdom. Let's get back to Jesus for a moment. The enemy has tried every trick he knows. He offered food to a starving man. He offered recognition to a nobody. And he offered power and glory to a poor wanderer. He'd done all he knew, and still Jesus turned him down. He said no. Imagine that burning fury. They must have been coursing through Satan at that moment. No one had ever resisted him. Not fully. Eventually, he'd gotten everyone to sin. Everyone. Without exception. He was even able to trick King David, a man called after God's own heart, into two major sins. And this Jesus of Nazareth had the nerve to resist him completely? In fury and in rage, Satan leaves Jesus. That's probably the moment he started working on getting others to want to kill the Lord. His fragile pride had been shattered. I told you to hold on to that thought about pride. We come back to it, and here it is. Notice for the first two temptations, Satan challenges the claim that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, make some bread out of these stones. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself off the temple and be saved from, your, from any harm. That's not because he wanted to make sure who he was dealing with. Before falling, Satan would have definitely seen Jesus. The other demons and evil spirits, they recognize him also. Easily. They don't ask, who are you? They say, we know who you are. He had no need to make sure that this was the Messiah who would bring his doom. No, he was trying to use pride. Here's what I know we've all struggled with at one point or another. It can range from simple arrogance to demanding for perfection from everything you do. How many of us have allowed Satan to get a foothold because he tickles our fragile egos? So what's the point in all this? Is John just telling you to read your Bible and stop being prideful? Yeah, that means what's wrong. Of course he is. But it goes beyond that. First, we can see the humanity of Jesus here. He was tempted by the devil to prove a point. Satan can be resisted if scripture is vital in our lives, if God is vital in our lives. If what God wants means anything to us, then we can overcome with his help. But we need to study his word. Scripture must be essential to us. Jesus would later tell his disciples to sell their cloaks to buy a sword. Having a sword would be that important. Later on still, Paul tells the Ephesians that the word of God must be our sword. If Jesus would have us sell our clothing to buy a sword, what should we be willing to give up for the living word of God, our spiritual sword? Second, I think it's a revelation of the enemy's tactics. I always tell everyone, we are at war. Anyone who listens, I will tell that. So close your eyes for this moment. Just humor me. 
For a moment, you're not sitting in a nice, comfortable building with a really good breakfast and decent musicians. Well, musicians. That's stretching out. I know you. You're sitting in the middle of a war camp. You know the battle is coming. Soon the enemy will attack. Hopefully we've all got our armor on and we've got our swords at the ready. We're just waiting on orders from the king to move out. Suddenly in marches our king general. In his hand is a piece of paper and he tells us that on that paper is the strategy the enemy will be using for the coming battle. In his arrogance, Satan gave away his battle plans. And our Lord has passed those plans on to us. What would you do in a battle if you knew every move your opponent was going to make? I don't think most of us have been in a battle, but in a chess game, what would you do if you knew every move your opponent was going to make? There'd be no, there shouldn't be any casualties because our general made his plans perfectly to counter the enemies. I want to leave you with a uh, few verses from James, the younger brother of Jesus, and consider this your benediction. James tells us, submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into, into gloom, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. That's meant for each of us here this morning. Please don't just ignore what I've been saying. We are at war and it's time we take it seriously. So if you're ready to take it seriously, then stand up. If you actually want to take this fight seriously, then stand up. With Jesus as our general and the Holy Spirit as our guide, and with the Father as our beacon, we cannot lose. Let's close the board. That's good. Father, I just ask now that you take each of us here. You take this camp of your soldiers, this congregation of your warriors, Father, and you equip them for battle. Lord, I ask that each of us now would be filled with such passion from the Holy Spirit that we would move, we would stand up, that we would take the war seriously. Father, I ask now that each one of us, you equip us, whether it's taking the gospel to school, to work, or to home. Lord, I just ask now, be with each of us here. We know the enemy's plan. We know he's coming. Lord, help us to resist him. Help us so that he will flee from us. And Father, I just ask now, take each of us into your army and help us to tear down his kingdom and grind it to dust. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.